NBA free agency continuing earlier this morning in about uh, the 11 o'clock hour. The Sixers make a deal with uh, Gerald Henderson, formerly of the Trailblazers. Two years, $18 million for Henderson. We'll dive into that. But really the big news over the 4th of July weekend, on the 4th of July, the one move that made the fireworks around the NBA is Kevin Durant going to Golden State. Alex Kennedy, he's the managing editor of BasketballInsiders.com, and he joins us with a look at that move and everything else. Ben Simmons made his debut. Will Dwayne Wade leave Miami? Let's bring Alex into the conversation. And, you know, I don't know where you felt, Alex, on the scale uh, of where uh, of Durant leaving Oklahoma City, but when he made his announcement yesterday, uh, was it a shocking move? Well, it was shocking just because that was a very tough decision to make. Uh, the night before, I had started to hear that he was leaving toward the Warriors, and uh, you know, I tweeted that out that you know he was strongly considering them. But there's a big difference between considering a team and actually committing to them and leaving uh, your city that you've been with for so many years. So. I had heard that the night before he was having a really difficult time with the decision. He was legitimately torn, uh, having, you know, trouble with it, talking to his people, uh, you know, his, his friends, his people that were in his inner circle, and uh, really struggling. Uh, he, he was looking at Golden State and Oklahoma City. Boston intrigued him as well, after, especially after they got Al Horford. So there were a number of teams that he was looking at. But I think uh, at the end of the day, Golden State just really impressed him during their meeting and during their pitch. They made it clear to him that he could win multiple championships there. And I think with Kevin Durant, one thing you've always heard him say is that he's tired of finishing second. He's tired of not being looked at as the NBA's best player or uh, you know, being talked about behind guys like Steph Curry and LeBron James. And they really made it clear to him the reason those guys are discussed is because they have championship rings. So that was one of the big things in their pitch, that if you come here, we can win a ton of rings together. We can do something that hasn't been done in the NBA in a very long time, maybe form a potential dynasty. That word gets thrown around an awful lot, but it, it really intrigued Kevin Durant. And I think especially with the way he plays, the way that you know he can play multiple positions, he can switch on defense, he's so versatile. He fits that team so perfectly uh, on the court. And then off the court, personality-wise, all those guys get along. They're unselfish. It's always team first. And that's who Kevin Durant is. So it just made a lot of sense from uh, pretty much every angle. So it was surprising to see him leave, and I think he had a really tough time breaking it to uh, Oklahoma City. But um, I think he's excited about the future, and uh, this this Golden State team is certainly scary. Alex, uh, is it good for basketball to see this? I mean, we're hearing about LeBron trying to get Dwayne Wade to go to Cleveland. It seems just like, hey, if you have a connection with somebody and they have the money, you can pretty much go where you want to go. Is that the direction that the league wants to see happen, uh, continuously happen. We've seen it happen in the past. Is that where the league wants to go? Is this move, Durant to Golden State, good for the league? It's a great question, and I think there's kind of two schools of thought here. On one hand, people say, okay, there's not going to be any parity. Uh, if you're a team that you know doesn't have multiple superstars, you have no chance of winning a championship. And I just interviewed Draymond Green yesterday. He even said that you know realistically, there's probably five teams that have a, a shot at winning a championship this next year and honestly five may be a bit high if we're being completely honest um so you you look at the nfl for example every year fans get excited going into the season because you see you know underdogs emerge and super bowl champs uh surprise everyone uh in the nba because there's seven game series because these star players team up there is a lot less parity um so i do think you can make that case that uh from if you're a fan in a smaller market or you're a fan uh, for you know, a team that isn't in the playoffs, you're probably frustrated right now because you realize that not only do you have a long way to go for your team, but there's a lot of roadblocks in the way, and especially in Golden State. But on the other hand, the other school of thought is that this is good for the NBA because anytime there's player movement, there's so much interest. If, you're, if uh, you remember whenever LeBron James went to Miami, everyone hated them, but they were always being talked about. They were constantly on TV. Um, I believe it was Doc Rivers that said anytime – uh, the NBA can open up ESPN or any of the talk radio, talk you know, talk shows. Uh, it, it's a good thing for the league, and uh, I, I always found it interesting. Um, Kevin Durant going to Golden State is going to be a story that's talked about nonstop for the next year. People are going to compare these teams, you know, compare them to past great teams. Uh, there's going to be so much attention on the league. People are going to watch their games and see how they play. Um, from a competition standpoint, I see what you're saying. There's certainly not as much parity as the NBA I'm sure, at once, I'm sure. But there's a lot of interest, and player movement seems to drive the NBA these days. Fans love it, 
and uh, it, it makes things very interesting in the summer. LeBron was a villain when he did what he did, and I think a lot of that was because of the way he did it, you know, the decision, the television show. Is Kevin Durant now a villain? I mean, he seems like he was one of the more likable guys. He's in a small market. He was very quiet. His team won. They they, they had a lot of success. Has he just turned into an NBA villain? And have the, the Warriors gone with him? I mean, they were a popular you don't see the team that wins the most game, the team that's the most dominant a lot of times, be the most popular. Yeah, I was going to say that. You know, the fact that he's joining the Warriors and they're already starting to get some hate, he could become a villain. Um, I don't think it'll be on the level of LeBron James because, like you said, with LeBron, there were already so many things that frustrated people with LeBron. Um, you know, the chosen one tattoo, some of his antics on and off the court, you know, the way he kind of carried himself and, uh, you know, was a bit cocky. And then not only, you know, announcing on national TV that he was leaving his hometown, uh, but then also doing the whole pep rally where they came out, you know, and that, that really rubbed a lot of people the wrong way. So I, I think not only did LeBron learn from that, but I think every free agent after that learned you can't do stuff like that because it puts a huge target on your back and it's not worth it. Um, and that's why, you know, the next time around LeBron James wrote the letter in Sports Illustrated. Now you have Kevin Durant, you know, breaking it on the Players' Tribune. Uh, and other players have really taken more subtle, uh, you know, ways to announce things like this. So I, I don't think he'll be, uh, you know, on the same level as LeBron in terms of hatred. I think there are still a lot of people who love his game and think he's, you know, a, a friendly guy. You know, all, all of my interactions with Kevin Durant have been phenomenal. You know, I, I can't speak for everyone, but he's a very nice guy, very accessible. You know, some superstars are very blocked off and guarded, but he's always been someone that, you know, will give you all the time in the world. He'll talk to you. You know, non-basketball conversations, he's just a friendly guy. So I think it's harder to put him in that villain mold, but certainly some people are going to try to do it because this Golden State team, you know, they are, they are kind of rubbing some people the wrong way. Steph Curry is getting a ton of attention, and people don't like that. It kind of reminds me of Tim Tebow a bit, and it seems like a strange comparison, but um, Tim Tebow, you know, if you look at his career, he didn't necessarily do a whole lot wrong. Uh, it was that he was getting so much attention, and the media was loving him so much that fans – basically just said, okay, you know, we've had enough, move on, let's stop talking about him. I feel like that's kind of where fans are with Steph Curry, uh, just because he's been praised and talked about so much. Draymond Green, obviously, he's had some controversy, uh, and people don't like him because of what he says, what he does on the court. So he's joining a team that people already don't like. I don't think Durant's going to be, you know, public enemy number one, but I certainly think, you know, Oklahoma City fans are going to prove him and hate him. Uh, around the, around the rest of the league, though, I, I can't see them hating him quite like they do or, or did LeBron. Hey, give me your thoughts um, from you were talking to Draymond Green and uh, BasketballInsiders.com managing editor Alex Kennedy's with us uh, right as this kind of was happening. What was his initial reaction when you say, hey, by the way, you guys just got Kevin Durant? Well, yeah, we had been talking right before the announcement. You know, we had been texting back and forth about, you know, when it was going to come out and trying to figure out you know, when we could get on the phone and do the interview. And then when I called him, he just started screaming and was going nuts, and uh, he, was, he was ecstatic. And, and really, it, it, it's interesting because he's been recruiting Kevin Durant for the last year, and that's one thing that he really revealed in that interview. Um, this isn't something that happened over the last month. Um, over the last year, he made it clear that, you know, he wanted Durant to come to Golden State. He saw everything that, you know, we're talking about now in terms of how Durant plays positionless basketball, how he's unselfish, how – you know, he could get along with them and fit personality-wise. So even whenever the Warriors came back and beat the Thunder in the Western Conference Finals after being down 3-1, uh, Green and Durant continued to talk. Green continued to talk to Durant during the NBA Finals. I mean, Green was really talking to Durant a lot throughout this last season, and it wasn't just him either. You know, guys like Steph Curry were texting Kevin Durant. You know, these guys were recruiting him for quite some time. And uh, and not just recruiting, but also building a relationship with him. They wanted to make sure that, you know, he knew that he would be welcome with open arms if he did want to make that decision. So it was interesting. Uh, Draymond was certainly excited, uh, under- understandably so. He called it the uh, one of the biggest moves in NBA history. Um, and, you know, he-, he basically said he feels like they have a chance to do something that we haven't seen in the league before because all of their players, this big four, when you talk about Curry, Thompson, Green, and Durant, they're all 28 years old or younger. So they're all either in their prime or about to enter their prime, and that's pretty scary. So they're extremely excited right now, and they can't wait to take the floor. Uh, Alex Kennedy's with us, basketballinsiders.com. How likely is it now that Dwayne Wade leaves Miami? It seems like there's something going on there. Um, he's beat with Cleveland. That doesn't sound good for them. 
I'd be surprised, to be completely honest with you. Um, you know, he's wanted to stay in Miami for his entire career. That's been something that he's talked about uh, for many years now, and Miami wants to keep him. Uh, he started scheduling some interviews with uh, the Bucks and the Nuggets and teams like that, but now it came out that he canceled his meetings with the Bucks. He's not going to meet the Bucks on Wednesday. Uh, so that, that, that's new, that he's you know canceling meetings. So really, I think what it comes down to is that means he's either – going back to Miami, or this whole Cleveland thing could become a reality. But you have to understand, if he goes to Cleveland, he's taking an enormous pay cut and just trying to win. Um, that's really what it comes down to. You know, he can go back to Miami now, and uh, they reportedly offered him uh, you know, $20 million uh, or $40 million over two years, so $20 million per year. So he can make a lot of money by going back to Miami. You know, now that they're out of the Kevin Durant sweepstakes, they have money to offer him. Or he can say, you know what, this Miami team, I don't think we're close to contending. I want to go play with LeBron again. But if that happens, he's taking a significant pay cut. Um, and, and that's a big risk. You know, at his point in his, at this point in his career with his injury history, not locking in a long-term deal and turning down that much money is pretty risky. So um, I think it is Miami or Cleveland. But if I had to guess, I'd say Miami. He wants to stay there. He loves Miami. I think this is all about leverage and getting more money out of them. Alex, uh, give me your thoughts on what you saw from Ben Simmons last night. Uh, you know, uh, fill the stat sheet, kind of what you can expect. You know, 10 points, 8 rebounds, the assist. I mean, a couple of uh, really nice passes. I mean, you got a glimpse of what people have kind of thought they would see. Give me your thoughts on what you th- saw from Simmons. Yeah, I'm, I'm a big fan of Simmons. Um, I think we talked about it on the show before, about how he's the perfect point forward. He's someone that, you know, shouldn't be able to – pass the ball and move the way he does at 6'10". He's phenomenal. Um, you know, I think that no-look pass he had through three defenders uh, was just ridiculous. I mean, there's so many plays like that that we're going to see throughout the season that, you know, are just uh, amazing. And it really shows what he can do uh, when he has some weapons around him. Um, and, you know, it was unfortunate to see him have the cramping and the issues like that. But, um, you know, Fortunately, it was nothing serious, but I think he's going to be absolutely fine in the NBA. Obviously, he needs to work on his jumper still. We know that. But when you have that kind of rebounding ability, that kind of passing ability, um, you know, I've been saying this word a lot throughout this interview, but, you know, being able to play multiple positions and be versatile, that's so important in today's NBA. And when you can bring the ball to the floor at 6'10 as a point guard uh, or you can play down low, that's very scary. You become a nightmare uh, to match up against. And, And I think that's what the Sixers have here. So, it's still very early. It's hard to determine what kind of career he's going to have and all of that. But I think if you're a Sixers fan, you saw enough flashes of brilliance yesterday and some glimpses to be excited. They had Gerald Henderson earlier today. They got Bayless uh, last week now. Um, you know, slow deals. They're not spending ridiculous money. I know last week when we talked, you had mentioned that they were looking to still add some guards. Uh, does Henderson fit the bill of a guy that uh, you like? Uh, over some of the guys that we mentioned last week, Deion Waiters, Harrison Barnes, Courtney Lee. You know, his name, uh, Henderson, didn't really come up, but how does he fit? Yeah, well, I'll put this out there. You know, I haven't really said this much, or I haven't really written this, but they were offering ridiculous contracts to some veteran guards, um, and they were shorter-term contracts. Uh, They went after Jamal Crawford and made a monster offer. It was a one-year deal that was – a lot of money, just a lot, a lot of money. <laughs> they went after Courtney Lee. They offered him a two-year deal that was uh, a huge sum of money as well. Um, they are trying to spend money. Uh, even though they've only landed, you know, Gerald Henderson and Jared Bayless and guys like that, you know, they've went after some of the more notable guys and they've made huge offers. But the problem is some of these veterans, you know, they even though the money is tempting, and certainly those guys considered it, the money is very tempting when it's being offered that way. Um, it, it's tough to go to a situation like that where you know you're not going to be a playoff team most likely and you're basically being a veteran mentor. And But I do want to say I, I like the fact that Philly's bringing in these veteran players because I think in our past conversations, one of my biggest gripes about this whole process was that you know they didn't have enough veteran leadership in that locker room. And if you want to develop young players, you need to have pros that can teach them how to make the transition to the NBA, how to be successful on and off the floor. So I think they've made the right moves here. I think Jared Bayless is a good point guard who's going to help their big men and some of the players around him. Gerald Henderson, I like his game a lot. I think at $9 million per year, he's a steal. You know, we've seen some crazy contracts thrown out. That one is certainly reasonable. He's a two-way player who uh, is very solid, very uh, consistent. 
I, I like those moves a lot. You know, they struck out in, in terms of trying to go after guys like Small Crawford and Courtney B uh, by offering big money. But at the end of the day, you know, they're, they're making some bargain signings and, and bringing in veterans, and I think that's very smart. All right, let's circle back to some of the other NBA news. Uh, we're talking with Alex Kennedy, BasketballInsiders.com. Uh, obviously, Durant, the big news, uh, what's going to happen with Dwayne Wade. But let's go to Oklahoma City now. What's the fallout for them? And because of this, you know, this is the sad part here where you have a team that has been in the finals. They've been a contender. They still have one of the best players in the world in Russell Westbrook, and they almost feel like they got no shot. Is there a good chance that he gets traded now? Basically, because they say, because we can't sign him. We're not going to be able to get him back. And we realistically aren't a title contender now. We're better off starting over. Yeah, I really think so. I, I would not be surprised if they traded Russell Westbrook, and that sounds crazy, but you look at their team, and they, they've done a pretty good job of being able to contend each year while still having a nice young core in place. Um, so if they were to trade Russell Westbrook, it's not like they'd be starting from scratch and having to rebuild and you know go after young guys you know right away. They already have young guys. When you talk about you know Stephen Adams, Ennis Cantor, Victor Oladipo, uh, Andre Roberson, they have a number of guys there that you know, could be core pieces for them going forward if they were to make a trade. And certainly, if you trade Russell Westbrook, you're getting a number of young players and draft picks back in return. He's going to be a guy that returns just a ton of a trade. Um, it's interesting, though, because he is coming up on free agency, he would, ha- he would have some control over the process. And, and that's always kind of tough in the NBA. Um, you know, some team out there would be willing to give up uh, a lot of pieces for him, even if he's just a rental and they don't have a long-term commitment from him. But then sometimes you have a situation like when Carmelo Anthony was traded to New York, he was, you know, shooting down teams saying, I'm not, I'll leave as a free agent if you trade for me. So he really kind of controlled that process. So, you know, not only do the Thunder now have to consider is Russell going to stay, should we trade him? Russell basically could control the process a bit and say, okay, here's where I want to go. Here's the teams I'd be willing to stay with if you trade me there. And that kind of adds another wrinkle to things. So it's going to be very interesting. Um, I think he's one of the best players in the NBA. So, uh, it, it makes things uh, extremely interesting. Uh, if I'm a team like Boston or Denver, who has just a ton of assets in terms of young players and draft picks, you have to get on the phone right now and, and make that call. Both of those teams have been talking about trying to acquire a star player, a superstar player. Um, it, it, you know, if they can get a long-term commitment from Russell, which you know it, it remains to be seen. Who knows if they can do that? But I think you know every team that has assets has to call the Thunder right now and see if Russell's available. Because, it, it, you know, he said he's not going to sign an extension. He's a free agent after next some, after next season. Uh, I think he could be available. Maybe Philadelphia, right? <laughs> they Maybe. Got, they, they got a lot of assets. Well. You never know. <laughs> <laughs> not sure he would want to stay long term unless, you know, they, they make a uh, huge turnaround. But, look, you know, when, when, when you're talking about teams with assets, Philly, Boston, Denver, those are the teams that come up. So if they were to say, look, we're going to trade for you. We can bring another free agent because we have tons of cap space. You know, suddenly things become a little bit different. You know, there, there's been teams that have went from being at the bottom of the standings. You know, look at the Boston Celtics back whenever they got Kevin Garnett and Ray Allen. They were at the bottom of the standings, um, and then they were able to bring in both guys together and then win a championship. The Miami Heat, you know, they, they were a lottery team, and then they landed both LeBron and Chris Bosh. Uh, sometimes, you know, you have to collect those assets and, uh, you know, just lose a lot of games, and then... Uh, it gives you some trade bait, and it gives you a ton of cap space to where you can go after a guy like that and say, okay, here, we're going to acquire you and go ahead and pick your teammates. It does become interesting. So much has happened uh, since we just last talked last week, Alex. I mean, Rondo's in Chicago, Horford's in Boston, Dallas looks like mini Golden State, uh, San Antonio <laughs> has Gasol. Uh, give me your thoughts on the teams that aren't Golden State and where they kind of fit in. Uh, with with the moves that were made over the weekend? Well, I think San Antonio's move is interesting. I like Gasol going there. I think they're going to really use him well. He's a a perfect San Antonio player when you talk about his fundamentals and his ability to play in the post. And it seems like they're going to lose David West, and there's been talk that Tim Duncan may retire. So getting him is huge for them. Uh, The other move that I love was Al Horford to Boston. Um, I think Al Horford's one of the more underrated players in the NBA. Uh, He's terrific. Um, That's a huge win for the Celtics. Uh, I, I think that the fact that Boston's in the Eastern Conference really makes that interesting, too, because all year long we talked about how there's really no team that can compete with Cleveland in the East. It was Cleveland and then everyone else, you know, then Toronto and some other teams like that. But now Boston, you have Isaiah Thomas, who's an all-star. 
Al Horford comes in and solves their biggest need down low and gives them a post scorer. You have Brad Stevens, who's one of the best coaches in the NBA, in my opinion. This Boston team, I think, you know, with another year of experience for the young players, with Jalen Brown, who's the third pick in the draft, with Al Horford, this team becomes pretty scary, uh, not just next year, but for years to come. So I'm excited to see what Boston can do. I think they're one of the huge winners outside of Golden State so far in free agency. Um, and then the last one you mentioned, the Rondo deal. I want to touch on that. I think it's very interesting. Um, it's one of those really weird contracts you don't see in the NBA very often. Basically, there's been reports that both sides can buy out or opt out of the deal whenever they want. Both sides have the option to buy out. So if Rondo's unhappy in Chicago at any time, he can leave. And if Chicago's unhappy with Rondo at any time, hmm. uh, they can cut him. And you don't see that. That's so strange. But it kind of shows the state of Rondo right now, where he's at in his career. You know, you don't know if you're going to get Boston, Sacramento, effective Rondo, or Dallas, you know, fighting with a coach, not effective Rondo. So it's a very strange contract, but I find that very interesting that, you know, both sides can say, okay, we're going to pull the plug on this and hurt the contract apart if it doesn't work out. I think that's very interesting. For the guys who are left, what's most interesting? The guys who are still available. Well, I think there's still some restricted free agents that are uh, interesting. Uh, Alan Crabb is someone that you're going to hear a lot about. He's a two-way player, a very good three-point shooter uh, from Portland. Um, I have Mo Harkless is another guy from Portland that uh, he's a 3 and D guy. He's getting a lot of attention. Uh, there, there's restricted guys that are going to have to wait because teams usually want to you know, put those guys on the back burner because you don't want to tie up your money while that you know, initial team waits to see if they're going to match your offer sheet. Jared Sillinger is another restricted free agent. Um, in terms of unrestricted guys, the ones that are left are the guys that have question marks. Uh, J.R. Smith, Lance Stevenson, Michael Beasley. Uh, you know, go down the list. The guy, Ty Lawson. The guys that you know are, are talented, and when things go well, they play very, they play very well, and they can be very effective. But there's a lot of question marks there, and teams are usually hesitant to bring those guys in early. I think right now the market kind of has to. Uh, you know, settle out a little bit. Smoke's going to clear a little bit from some of these free agent signings, and then that's when you're going to see guys like Jr. and Lance and Ty start to get some interest. But you know, teams are, are very careful with players like that that have had issues. You know, I wouldn't be surprised if teams just wanted to give them a one-year deal or a one-year deal with a second-year team option. Uh, but in terms of guys left, I think those are some of the more attractive names. Last one for Alex Kennedy, BasketballInsiders.com. Uh, how about the Knicks uh, and what they've, you know, the, the the Rose deal was kind of mixed emotions for people. Uh, then they ended up going with Noah and now uh, Lee. They've added some more. Uh, how do you like the way the Knicks are moving now? Initially, I criticized it a lot. I thought that uh, Joe Kim Noah, I did not like that signing. I thought he was very, uh, he, he was declining last year. He was not productive last year. So to give him four years and $17 million, I was shocked by that. But I will say every other move they've made, I like. Um, I think that uh, Derrick Rose was a low-risk, high-reward move. He is an expiring contract. They didn't have to go too much for him. So I think that makes a lot of sense. If he can play like he did in the second half of last season, not even MVP-style Derrick Rose, if he plays like he did in the second half of last season, it's a huge upgrade at point guard for them. And then I love the fact that they went out and got Brandon Jennings uh, on a one-year $5 million deal. That's a bargain deal for Brandon Jennings. So if Rose does get hurt, you have a starting caliber point guard to step in in his place. Um, and then the Courtney Lee deal, that's one of my favorite deals that's happened so far this summer. Uh, to get him for four years and $50 million, he is a terrific two-way player. He knows his role. And I think in a team like that where you have Carmelo Anthony, Chris Stasporzingis, Derek Rose, guys that need the ball in their hands, having a guy like Courtney who's going to defend and make the hustle plays and you know, be a veteran leader, I think that's absolutely huge for that team. So initially with the Noah deal, I wasn't very uh, on board with the Knicks moves, but recently I think Phil's done a pretty good job. Alex Kennedy at Alex Kennedy NBA. He's the managing editor, basketballinsiders.com. Check out his Q&A uh, with Draymond Green, uh, now part of the big four in Golden State. I guess that'll be official in a couple of days from now. Alex, always a pleasure, and I'm sure you are running down plenty more NBA stories. Thanks, man. Thanks a lot. Take care.